Good evening, everyone. This is Manjeet Kripalani, the Executive Director at Gateway House. We are a nonpartisan foreign policy think tank based in Mumbai. Welcome to the Gateway House KAS, the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung webcast, part of a continuing partnership between our two institutions. Thank you to two people who made this evening possible. Peter Ramel, the Director of KAS in India, and my colleague, Commander Amrut Godpole, who co-envisioned our discussions on Asia, particularly important at this time of continental uncertainty. We have this evening a cracking panel of experts to discuss the new geostrategic reality that is the Indo-Pacific from all angles, defense, economic, trade, regional. Uh, Rear Admiral Sudarshan Shikhandi, former head of Naval Intelligence in India. Captain Jim Fennell, former director of Intelligence and Information Operations of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Rahul Bajoria, chief economist for Barclays Investment Bank, who covers India and the Antipodes. That's all the way to Australia. And Elena um, Akinasova Cornelis, who teaches international relations at the University of Antwerp, and who is a Japan expert. We will start the meeting with a 40 minute discussion with the panelists to be followed up with a 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Please use the chat box to ask your questions. We will ensure that it runs smoothly. Kindly mute yourselves through the session. Before I begin my oration, I request Peter Ramel of KES to welcome you all today. Peter. Yes, <clears throat> thank you Manjit. Esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the already rapid change in the current international order have only been accelerated further by the corona pandemic. The crisis before us has laid bare the vulnerability of international trade and once again international law, standards and rules are under attack, maybe even more frequently than they are being adhered to. These developments are exemplified in the Indo-Pacific, where the eating influence of China and the United States are forcing other interested parties to re redefine their approach in terms of security and take positions. With both the Silk Road and the string of pearls strategies China is targeting Europe and Asia, both and their markets. And it is high time to find answers to both. Those answers may be well found in the Indo-Pacific. Looking at Europe, Europe, of course, is not a military power and Germany is even a lesser one, if at all. We cannot compete with China, with India, with the United States, and we also would not want to do that. But sovereignty is being threatened in the Indo-Pacific. I give a sample. Uh, take the French overseas collectivity of New Caledonia, situated east of Australia and harboring 25% of the world's nickel during the referendum on independence there, it was the fear of becoming a Chinese colony in the wake of independence from France that led to a win by unionists. Those fears are not exactly unfounded. Today we'll probably hear more about China's aggressive moves to force cash-strapped island economies into its fold through financial coercion. While these developments are of immediate concern to the nations of the Indo-Pacific, Europeans have yet to develop a sense of consciousness for this threat. They are not only far in distance, they are also still far in uh, thinking that it is of their concern. During its latest propaganda stunt, China has sent masks and medical equipment to corona-stricken Italy and when those crates arrived in Venice, they carried neighborly greetings. It is well about time for us in Europe to understand that those are not metaphors and neither should they be understood as anything but threats. In our globalized economy, we are all neighbors of one sort or another. European belief that China and the rest of the world are far away is just that, a belief. If the corona pandemic has shown us one thing, it is just how close we are to each other now and how little the distances, the physical distances matter in the 21st century. 
What happens in the Indo-Pacific does not threaten European territorial integrity directly, as it does in New Caledonia or French Polynesia. But we have to wake up to the fact that every small island that is being converted, converted into a Chinese-controlled strategic harbor weakens the free, open nature of Indo-Pacific, putting all of us at risk. Every such harbor makes China's security footprint in the region bigger and tightens its control. Therefore, Europe needs to define a new approach to regional security in the Indo-Pacific. The current connectivity strategy, what was approved in 2016, is at least a step in the right direction. It acknowledges China's aspirations, understands that we need to establish alternatives to them, and this can only ever be done with regional partners like those making up the so-called Quad. We share a vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, largely and especially free of any one entity establishing hegemony. Europe needs to align itself with the Quad countries, which have to all often felt, which all have often felt left alone in the past. So I'll conclude. We all have stakes in the Indo-Pacific. The corona crisis has led many Europeans finally to realize the arrogance in believing that Europe was not intrinsically connected to the rest of the world, and especially Asia. As much as the coronavirus was with us in a matter of month, we need to understand that what happens in the Indo-Pacific, we will have repercussions that will inevitably also affect us in Europe. I believe Europe and Germany, as a part of it, need to step up their activities in the Indo-Pacific and align themselves with the Quad countries to balance out threats to the free and open Indo-Pacific. I guess our event, so being a German organization, we can only contribute little to it, but we cannot make up for lacking awareness in Europe. We can only try to get them more aware, but I'm sure our experts will come back to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And I'm going to start right away. You, you really said it is heartening to know that Europe, um, that you feel Europe should align itself with the Quad. And we're going to take you up on that a little bit later. Um, I'm going to start first. My first question will be Admiral Sudarshan Shikande. Uh, Sudarshan, India has already diplomatically embraced the Indo-Pacific. Specifically, how should India operationalize this commitment in the Indo-Pacific waters? Uh, thank you, Piti, and uh, thank you for the opportunity and thanks to all uh, participants and uh, viewers around the world. Um, let, me, let me just begin by saying that I would like to present a different and perhaps a somewhat differently realistic and a more than oceanic or maritime perspective of the Indo-Pacific. Um, are we confusing ourselves that because it is a hyphenated term of two oceans, it is essentially maritime? Um, the, the, the nomenclature of, is of course maritime, but I would like to suggest here that even, even the NATO is far less about the North Atlantic than it always was about Europe and about, uh, about the Soviet Union at that time. So uh, while, while the term may be oceanic, actually uh, uh, the focus is on problems on land and the ocean nomenclature helps us in some ways. I do not deny that. Uh, as such, uh, even the term Asia-Pacific was, of course, far more about Asia than it was about the Pacific as an ocean. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, really uh, splitting hairs over the term. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, we need to go beyond uh, looking at uh, the Indo-Pacific as primarily a maritime arena and with primarily the maritime methods and therefore maritime solutions to most of the problem because it is, it is really not that. Uh, therefore, uh, it, is, it is of course, you know, when, when we talk about uh, the Indo-Pacific, it's easier always to talk about global commons, about freedom of navigation, about piracy, about maritime terrorism, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, other than really get, getting involved in, in more messier things. Um, we, we, we need to get involved in, in messier things. And I just want to mention here that uh, Julian Corbett, the maritime historian, strategist, 
you know while while it did say man uh, so long as man lives upon the land and not upon the sea etc etc and i don't think we should forget that uh, he said it of course in in a different context but i think the context applies here uh, so there are there are you know uh, uh, certainly more deliverables in uh, looking at the maritime nature of the indo pacific uh, it it helps us at times uh, see some progress it helps helps us to create a pretense of uh, progress uh, because we we are able to do a lot of things in, in the maritime field without really treading on toes because man doesn't live upon the sea so there are not too many toes to be tread upon but i think some of that is uh, required uh, it, the indo pacific so Admiral, you know uh, was yes sorry may i interrupt how is india going to operationalize its commitment Yes, I'm, I'm really just coming. Important. Yes, yes. So, and and therefore, one of one of one of the things that we need to do, and that was my next point, is that apart from the maritime, we need to operationalize the quad. I've I've recently written about it uh, that the quad needs to move, and it has, I think, moved from talk to quite, you know, the beginnings of a walk, but it also needs to move from what I would term uh, from a from a quad to a squad, uh, and and the squad needs to have. Uh, a few more countries participating than just the quad uh, it has to become ultimately a quad plus so uh, you know uh, the, the the real issues therefore even even in the quad uh, have to have to uh, get on to uh, issues that we have we have not yet uh, talked about so fundamentally many of the issues that trouble the quad countries uh, at least two or three of the quad countries are territorial uh, they are territorial they they they, they They troubled the United States because the United States has treaty partnerships with Japan. Japan. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the issues of it is less about freedom of navigation, but what is happening in the South China Sea uh, and the South China Sea is really about you know less about freedom of navigation than uh, violations of sovereignty. All the while, while the People's Republic of China insists upon its own sovereignty uh, sensitivities and and you know. Uh, Stepping on other people's toes as far as their own sovereignty is concerned, we need to be far more vocal uh, 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 about uh, 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 Senkaku issue with Japan. I think we have we have also, as in, in India, tried to avoid that. Uh, likewise, to be fair, uh, you know, most most countries don't really talk very very uh, uh, openly and with as much support as is required for our own issues of sovereignty that uh, that. Uh, come into conflict with china and with pakistan um there are china is probably going to have future problems with russia um i i i think it's only a matter of time and we india will play a role in that because of a good relationship with russia and japan's is improving relationship with russia uh we uh, uh to do this to the to do all this in the, in the indo pacific is difficult and that's why i would suggest that we need to uh uh bolster uh, and really move on more robustly with the quad itself uh, uh then then the other other issue is that uh, you know india itself needs to demand and uh, expect uh, more support political diplomatic support on its issues of sovereignty uh, with respect to china currently what is going on uh, uh the, the 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 finally a, a few points that uh, we need to support asean a lot more with the south china sea disputes uh, we need to take asean uh, uh, and and the quad more towards each other uh, we, we need to we need to uh, try and become more open uh, in india support to taiwan uh, we are still very circumspect about it many countries are circumspect about it uh, that, that's that's true and we have to move slowly but in a, in a, in a steady direction uh, in in terms of economic partnership itself i think the united states need, needs to get back to the tpp by whatever uh, whatever face saving device uh, that they can think of having having ditched the uh, tpp uh, th th that is something to really look into because i don't think what really can be an economic arrangement uh, there are there are just too many contradictions uh, uh, for, for for that to happen and, and you need a larger group with, a, with more countries in it um right so other than i'm going to hold you there okay. i'm okay. going to hold you there right back to you because you have made many many very interesting points so i'm going to move over to jim
and I'm going to ask his views on this. You have an experience with the Indo-Pacific, both in the policy and the operational area. What would you now like to see happen nationally within countries and multilaterally to make the Indo-Pacific a power alliance? You've heard the Admiral, so. Yes, uh, well, first of all, I'm uh, honored to be uh, participating and hosted by Gateway, Gateway House and KAS. I'm, it's a great honor to be in this uh, distinguished panel. And I find myself in, in a lot of agreement with the Admiral's comments uh, regarding uh, uh, this idea that uh, the Indo-Pacific concept is much more than just a naval treaty or a naval alliance or just a maritime domain uh, situation. Uh, but to answer your question, I think from my perspective, the most important thing that I would like to see from uh, the Quad Nations or Squad Nations, those nations that are aligned ideologically around the principles of freedom and liberty and democracy, I think that we need to start really recognizing something that I've been talking about for about a decade, which is that the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party are on a timeline of activity. And so a lot of times there's uh, discussions about China is, you know, takes the long view and, and considers things down the road and that they're not willing to cause a uh, controversy because they'd rather wait and see how things play out. And I think that's a false notion. And what you're seeing today, if you just look around the, the rim of China, you see uh, aggressive activity in the South China Sea where no foreign Navy warship from any nation can go into the South China Sea without being challenged by the PRC to say that you're violating our territorial waters and you haven't asked our permission to enter the South China Sea. We're seeing increased uh, flight activity around the island of Taiwan. Just yesterday, there was an announcement from the Chinese that their bombers approached Taiwan from the east, not the west, but from the east. Uh, the Admiral mentioned the Senkakus. Uh, there's increased activity in the Senkakus. Reports in the last month of Chinese submarines in the waters near the Senkakus. Uh, Chinese Coast Guard vessels uh, setting records of duration inside the contiguous zone. Right. India's experiencing its own problems right now uh, on the line of actual control where you've had actually your people, your citizens, your soldiers killed by aggressive Chinese actions. Today, we just read that China is now making inroads into uh, Bhutan, with a, a wildlife uh, area in Bhutan and a disputed area there, and China is aggressively pushing it there. We've also seen over the last six to eight weeks, North Korea suddenly spur up again after they were quiet the last couple of years, relatively quiet. Now, we don't know if China's directly endorsed that, but it seems likely. And so China is right now demonstrating uh, a set of confidences that we haven't seen before, and certainly a break from what Deng Xiaoping had admonished the Chinese leadership to do, which is to uh, bide your time and hide your capabilities. And that has certainly changed under Xi. And in 2013, Xi said with respect to Taiwan, we will not wait forever to take back our territory. And so I have, uh, everything that I know suggests that China is on a timeline, and they've told us that their timeline is centered around these two centennials. One is the 2021, which is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, and then 2049, which is the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. And I believe that the Chinese leadership are on a timeline to restore what they call rejuvenate, but they used to say restore, their territorial sovereignty. And all those areas that I just mentioned, they consider to be theirs. And they were going to use everything in their what they call comprehensive national power, diplomacy, economics, information, military, all of these levers of national power to get their objective, which is to have territorial uh, integrate, uh, sovereignty and inclusion of everything that they believe is their sovereign territory. And they would prefer to get it without using a shot. They would prefer to do uh, influencing and the art of war uh, without ever actually having to use combat. But over the last 20 years, we've seen them build their military up. And they are now in a stage of confidence that we've never seen before. And I believe what we are in right now, and I've written about this, which is to say we are entering the decade of concern that in the next 10 years, if Chinese leaders are unable to acquire the territory that they believe is theirs through non-kinetic means, 
that the PLA and those that favor using the PLA will become more and more uh, uh, convincing in their arguments inside Zhanghai to convince the leadership that it's time to use military force. And so the question then becomes for the, the Quad or the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, community, what are we going to do about it? And I think uh, the Admiral mentioned several things, which is that we need to get it together and we need to provide a credible deterrent force to China to let them know that if they are seeking to do what they, what I think they're trying to do, that they're going to be met with uh, the force, and not just military force, but the economic force and the diplomatic force and the information force of all the nations that are aligned that say, we're not going to accept this. Because right now we're seeing China put a million plus people in concentration camps in Xinjiang. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they've already made for decades inroads and to control Tibet. They've just now passed a new national security law for the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. It makes it virtually impossible for anybody in Hong Kong now to enjoy freedom and liberty uh, that they had previously had for decades. Yes. And so the, the reality is, is that China presents an existential threat to the, uh, the principles that all of our nations <coughs> say that we agree to. We don't always have aligned uh, visions on everything at the tactical or operational level, but at a strategic level, our nations do agree about the, the democracy and about freedom and about liberty. And if we don't want to live in a world um, where we have to have approval from the Chinese to leave our, our, our houses because our app on our phone doesn't say we have a green check, but a red X. If that's the world we want to live in, then fine, we can just do nothing. But I think what's needed right now at this time, especially with the impacts of the COVID, is that uh, we need to come together and we need to start putting aside some of these minor differences and get on with focusing on the, on the big things that, that put us together. So that, that's Thank all I'd like you. to say right now. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot. Um, I'm going to move to the economics right away because as uh, the Admiral and you both point out that everyone thinks that uh, the Indo-Pacific is really a maritime construct and it's taken people time to understand that it is more than that. It's a land construct. It's also an informational construct. Uh, most importantly, it's an economic dominance construct. Uh, against China. So Rao, you've been covering the economics of this region for years. You understand the trade agreements and the trade routes. Many of these are now really weak. Um, RCEP, you know, two of the four core members are not signed on to RCEP. That's uh, India and the US. Australia and Japan would like us to, but, you know, should they really be forcing us to do it? How can this region blossom under the security cover of a new Indo-Pacific partnership, but economically blossom. Uh, thanks, Manjeet. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to speak alongside such an esteemed panel. You know, thanks to Gateway House and uh, and KAS for for inviting me. Uh, so, what I would say is that you know, let's sort of take a step back and think about you know what were the economic realities coming into uh, you know the, the the last four five years. You know, so effectively. Uh, when President Obama decided to kind of, you know, introduce the foreign policy angle of a pivot towards Asia, one of the cornerstone policies of that was greater economic integration, uh, as Admiral uh, Shrikhande was uh, mentioning, uh, with the ASEAN and with the, with the wider Asia-Pacific Rim. And, you know, with the uh, 2016 presidential elections and the subsequent shelving of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and, and then, you know, followed by India's withdrawing from the RCEP agreement, basically the two large trade agreements that were supposed to have increased the economic integration are currently in tatters, right? So while uh, a, a sort of a raggy version of both the trade agreements are still around, uh, it is hard to see how there can be significant economic integration without trade being at the center of it. Because remember, like, while the larger countries, you know, which have large domestic markets, which are broadly self-sufficient in, in a lot of fields, they are, they are going to do well. A lot of the small open economies, particularly in Southeast Asia and East Asia, are going to have a difficult time in, in, in signing on to Indo-Pacific unless and until there's going to be a significant economic benefit that comes out of it. Now, within that perspective, we also have to keep in mind that 
uh, a lot of these countries are already very highly integrated, right? So uh, Asia as a whole trades uh, the most amount within itself. And over the last two decades, you know, China has become not just a, a, a processing center for most of the Asian economies, but it also become a very large market for both export of goods and export of services, right? So whether we think about, you know, just to put some numbers in context, you know, even if we take the quad, for instance, you know, every single country in the quad with the exception of India actually does more trade with China than what they do with a combined strength of all of each other, right? So the economic integration, even for the quad countries is, 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 is a reality. Uh, it can be changed over time, but then, you know, it will certainly require a lot of effort and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of focus uh, from, from from these large countries. So when you then sort of put say ASEAN as a as a test case, you know where you have several conflict areas between different countries in China over the South China Sea. Uh, there there are military issues over there, but then the economic integration, even with countries like Taiwan, has been so strong that it's very difficult to kind of get away from uh, you know from from such a, a formulation without leaving behind a very significant amount of socioeconomic damage, right? So uh, till the time there are strong mitigation policies in place, it's always going to be tricky. Uh, another point I would like to mention here is that when we just think of it from the perspective of, uh, uh, you know, what's happening with say countries like, uh, like Indonesia, you know, they have uh, made an attempt to kind of uh, deter the, you know, the, the, the actions of, of the military in, in South China Sea from China, but then even they are uh, on board with the idea of signing the RCEP, you know, the tourist dependency is quite high. Uh, I, I think it will, you know, it, it's just one of the realities of, of the fact that there is going to be challenges as far as the economic integration is concerned. I think there have been some steps that have been taken to kind of increase uh, integration. So, you know, like Australia and India have, have tried to increase trade. There's been significant push from the Indian side to kind of try and increase trade, but a lot of it is coming in the garb of selective protectionism as well from all sides, right? So in some sense, uh, there, the, the economic compact is, is, you know, something that we have to kind of put at the center of this entire discussion without which, you know, while some security interests are going to, uh, you know, uh, they're going to be complementary in nature. Uh, if the economic interests do not align, I think it will be difficult uh, for, for there to be large scale support for, for, for such an idea. And that's what we have seen from a lot of small open economies, particularly who are in the middle uh, of the Indo-Pacific. Before we move on, do you think India is capable? Because you're absolutely right. Uh, the support members are still very shy about making big steps. So India is going to, I'm going to ask each of the panelists this question. India is going to have to make a lot of the first moves. And do we even, are we even thinking about that? Do we even have a vision about what trade agreements could mean since we are really not on board? We haven't really been in the supply chain of the global trade system for so long um, and we don't have the expertise. Yeah, so I would say from India's perspective, we have actually seen, you know, the broad global trends of protectionism or, you know, at least re-looking at trade as a, as a positive driver uh, you know, coming through in, in, in a way where protectionism is probably preferred, or at least there, there are signs that, uh, you know, we are, we are putting up walls, you know, economic barriers more than uh, we, we are tearing them down. Uh, you know, to give you an example, uh, like, you know, there, there's the often cited case of the mobile handset telephony sector, which has kind of taken off in India. You know, we have started to produce a lot more right. uh, hardware in the country. But then what we don't often talk about is that most of it is coming from foreign companies who are operating in India, not so much. And in fact, Chinese companies who are operating in a big way. So we have to be very selective right. about the kind of uh, protectionist arguments we are making. I think a, a, a sweeping generalization is going to be fairly damaging. And this is where, uh, you know, in my conversations with people in Southeast Asia, I've often heard the concern that what comes across often uh, in, when, when we talk about, you say, Atmanir Bharat and, you know, like protection, it, it sort of sounds like an old, uh, old reference to, you know, the old days of like import substitution and self-reliance. That's right. And, and so we have to be very careful in the way we, we, we deal with it, especially with economic partners where we have a dominant trading relationship that is, mm. we export more than what we are importing from them. Right. Thank you. Elena, um, 
you had, we had a discussion earlier really uh, about the difficult conceptualization of the Indo-Pacific. You know, what is the role of the US and, and Japan? Uh, do they diverge? Do they both think about it differently? Do they diverge? What is the Indian view? What does Australia really think? And before we move on to that, what really is the EU's position on the Indo-Pacific? Many European nations, as Peter mentioned, like France, have island borders across the Indo-Pacific. 90% of France's EEZ is in the e Indo-Pacific. And so Europe has a direct interest. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the very kind invitation to engage in this very important and timely debate with such uh, distinguished members of, of our panel. Um, well, I probably will start uh, with my response by actually quoting Peter, how he actually started uh, his presentation. Yes. And I have wrote it, uh, noted down how he said that Europe's have yet to, Europeans have yet to develop a sense of consciousness, indeed. And I think that would be uh, perhaps the very short answer to your question, the very short answer. I will, of course, expand on that uh, concerning EU's position. Now, first of all, uh, there is no such thing as only one EU position because we have 27 members, right, of the European Union. And there's quite a lot of divisions on how they perceive Asia, in particular, how they perceive China. Because one of the main issues for the European Union when we talk about EU's Asia policy essentially has been for a very long time EU's China policy. And for a very long time, actually, for the EU, Asia was one. China, a second, China's trade relationship, because of course for the European Union, uh, uh, China is what has been over the past years the first or the second largest trading partner, whereas for of course China the EU. And for us in the European Union, China is our critical and main source of imports, in particular for important countries such as Germany, but also other major, one of our largest economies, look at the Netherlands, look at the British, look at the Dutch, uh, so the Netherlands indeed, and, and other France. And so there has been uh, in the, within the European Union this kind of a concern about, okay, we have our China, very important trading partner, but on the other hand, we also have the EU's projecting itself and creating this uh, identity as a normative power, right? The EU promoting very important norms and rules, um, the rule of law, uh, democracy, human rights. And so you have to make this very difficult balance between economic and trade interests with China and the values that you promote and adhere to. So how do you find the sweet spot between the two. It has been very hard. And in fact, uh, for a long time, the EU has really avoided the discussion and the reference to China as a geopolitical player. So therefore, for a long time, the focus was simply on economic gains. What can we gain from our relations with China? Rather than, as has been the case in the Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific, that purely infrastructural economic initiatives do not exist. Right. Infrastructure right. is linked with geopolitical ambitions. However, right. in Brussels, that perception has been changing over the years, in particular as a result of the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative right. on Europe, on European uh, unity, on the values and, of course, the policies. And so we, what we see actually here in Europe, the divide and rule strategy, very similar to divide and rule strategy that we see with regard to China's policies uh, with regard to ASEAN. So you roll out the carpet with economic and infrastructural initiatives and you try to divide European states, right. those that has, have the most to gain from those that oppose certain policies. And then you try to, from China's perspective, of course, to reach your and achieve your interests. And one of the examples is the South China Sea, the ruling on the Philippine-China case. Just four years ago, right, in, in, in the second, mid-June it happened, 2016, I happened to be in Asia at the time, and I remember my Asian friends and colleagues telling me, Elena, we're waiting for a very strong European statement as the ruling was handed down, handed down in mid-June. What happened? Well, 
the EU leaders struggled for almost three days to right. deliver a statement, which at the end was very soft, without references to China, and simply stating that Europe, you know, supports peaceful resolution of disputes and in line with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And so basically, uh, yes, the European Parliament now has been uh, passing that non-binding resolution. The European yes. Parliament has, is not a critical player in EU's decision making. And by the way, just a few days later, it was last week, I believe on Monday, when the EU-China video conference took place. And what happened? Well, what happened is that uh, the, the president of the Commission and of the Council uh, they were sort of on the demanding side with regard to China. Could you please, President Xi Jinping, consider the investment and trade agreement yes. because it has been going on for seven years. And there was kind of asking China to please consider maybe to move forward with this agreement. And the European leaders, there was a reference to, of course, Hong Kong. There was this suggestion that there may be sort of a repercussions for China but there was no mentioning of sanctions and, and Sweden was the only country that actually said or proposed that there should be sanctions if indeed the law on Hong Kong was adopted. So I don't think, unfortunately, to respond to your question that we have to read a lot into this, uh, you know, new European Parliament's resolution. Uh, unfortunately, Europe, in my view, will remain divided, uh, not only in terms of what is the Indo-Pacific, but what EU's role in Asia should be and what EU's China policy should be. And there will continue to be these struggles between countries that, for example, at the time back in 2016, when Hungary and Greece really opposed a very strong position and statement um, of, of the EU on, on the South China Sea, so that, that will continue to be. And China, unfortunately, with the Belt and Road Initiative, has been and, in my view, will continue to be able to divide and sort of, uh, you know, kind of advance its interest by dividing the, the countries, European countries, uh, from each other and preventing the EU to, you know, make strong positions on Taiwan right. or, or the South China Sea and on Hong Kong. Now, uh, but surely, I, surely, Elena, the, surely, Elena, that the, that the Chinese game is clear. And so why would there still be a fear on the part of the EU uh, with its many, many strengths, uh, to still not be able to simply be, as the Americans say, upfront with China. Because in EU, the concern is about the potential repercussions, economic and trade repercussions for the European Union. That's one. And second, it's very hard for the European Union to come up with one united position or statement. Think about only, uh, I gave an example of the South China Sea, but also last week, following that video conferencing between the EU leaders yes. and China, there was no even a statement, there was no joint statement following, following that video conference. And within the European Union, the countries, for example, Central and Eastern Europe, those that are the most so far have gained or have seen certain benefits from the Belt and Road, they do not want to be part of being hijacked by any harsh statements and to have for example, negative repercussions for the Belt and Road initiatives from which they are sending to gain. Beneficiaries. In a, in, right. a, in a similar way, I would refer to ASEAN, because ASEAN similarly has been very much divided. And within ASEAN, most of the member states do not have territorial disputes with China. And the statement, we don't want to be hijacked, and I specifically use that word hijacked by the South China Sea dispute, that has been used by ASEAN. And that has come up in many ASEAN discussions by most of the member states which do not have territorial disputes and they do not want to have ASEAN as a whole being positioned as having disputes with China because it's not the organization but only specific right. member states. So that's, I think, a similarity. Right. Now, uh, perhaps later on, if you would like me to reflect on the different conceptualizations of Indo-Pacific, or would you like yes. me now to... No, Let's do that. Let's do that later. I'm going to go back to uh, to the Admiral, to Sudarshan. Sudarshan, you made some very, very um, interesting uh, points. And the question, again, is back to India. Will India have to do all the heavy lifting in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, 
you come from the services, the Navy, which is really the most competent and which is the front line in the current Indo-Pacific um, sort of new engagement. Will India have to, is everybody just too coy? As Elena says, you know, nobody really wants to make a joint statement, even with the US and Australia and um, Japan, will we have to do the, the heavy lifting? And can we? Uh, I, I think we can and we, we ought to uh, do that. And here is where I would like to, you know, just suggest that the two biggest countries in the, in the Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific, uh, with one country each, and you just look at the contrast. Uh, and that's what we need to pitch for and take up take up some of the leadership uh, roles that need to be taken up. 1.3 billion people so, on either side of the Himalayas, you know, one uh, on our side, you know, it's a noisy, free, uh, raucous democracy even. And it's quite amazing that as we enter the third decade of, of the 21st century, that on the other side, you know, 1.35 billion people uh, can still be under an authoritarian, you know, system. So, so that's... Uh, uh, that 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 is what uh, you know needs needs to be uh, focused upon. Uh, the uh, the yeah. other aspect, uh, the the other Go aspect, of, uh, uh, other aspect of course is that that uh, India uniquely offers uh, again in in a contrast the aspect of rule of law. We have large uh, professional, apolitical, and capable armed forces, and I think we need to step up to the plate and do a lot more. Quite apart from that, what, what was mentioned by uh, the other panelists is that we have a large economy and we can be, you know, both a workshop and a market. And therefore, how do we, while, uh, you know, uh, enhancing uh, uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, how do we still remain globalized in, in a way that is going to be mutually beneficial? And other than that, I think India's maritime geography, uh, the, Navy, the Indian Navy, uh, our, our maritime strengths and our friendships and the regional, uh, you know, help that we have been able to give in the Indian Ocean region itself are, are great virtues. Uh, finally, I would like to say that, you know, the, the other thing unique that is acceptable about India is to use, uh, and I've used this earlier, is to, you know, what, what George Kennan's phrase about the Soviet Union uh, said that its policies were based on an unfriendliness of purpose. Uh, by contrast, India's policies, uh, unlike China's today, are based on a friendliness of purpose, which is perceptible to others, which is which is welcomed by others, and which, which we need to uh, be less bashful about. So India is a big country. Yes. We have to take a central role. And uh, we, we can, you know, as, as a quad, as, as other members of the Indo-Pacific, look at infrastructure development and try and, you know, give give uh, uh, all other nations and ourselves an alternative uh, to the silk news, if I may put it this that way, of, of the, you know, one belt, one road uh, that dating is offered. Uh, something that is that is uh, easier easier to uh, uh, take support of rather than just a good feeling around the neck of a silk news. Right. Thank you, Admiral. And I think India's move yesterday to ban um, 59 Chinese apps I mean that takes uh, that takes some courage from a country that is viewed as being unable to face up to China for a long time. So, so maybe we're maybe we're on the path that you say we are on, or we should be on. Um, uh, Rahul, I'm coming to you in a second. Uh, what are the trends that will shape the future of trade in the region, and how can India now just think we're on a fresh slate? We've got a new. I mean, the whole world is being sort of re-lateralized, right? The multilateral world is changing. Everything is changing. Trade agreements are going to change. And how can India insert itself into these trade, regional trade agreements, new ones, old ones, in a way that fulfills its own goal of self-reliance? You know, which, we, which we've discussed, but here it is. It's on the table. Sure. So I, I would say, you know, just to, again, put things into context, you know, India's manufacturing sector uh, within its own country it's about uh, uh, less than 20% of its GDP. Uh, China, on the other hand, is more than 25% of the total world. So all more, one out of every four uh, products uh, globally are made in China. Uh, now, within that context, when you start looking at what has happened in the last decade, it has effectively been a very uh, stagnating period uh, for India's exports and India's manufacturing. Uh, 
I think uh, till the time India's economy, uh, particularly its exports, don't come back on track, it is going to be difficult for India to really offer any large deals, uh, you know, for 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 any countries uh, in its vicinity or even uh, otherwise. So from that perspective, I think you know urgent economic reforms uh, are are required. Uh, there needs to be, uh, you know, our regulatory cholesterol, I think, has built up uh, quite significantly in the last two decades or so. You know, as we started growing, uh, the urgency to kind of get economic growth uh, was probably declining. And, you know, we have seen some economic reforms come back, but then the number of, uh, you know, challenges, particularly, I would say, increasingly around federal structure. So, you know, whether it is tax challenges, it is, you know, coordination with the state and center of projects, these have been rising and there are several anecdotes around it. So I think till the time India really manages, manages its own house and you know, gets its own house into order, it will be difficult for us to really be competitive at a global stage. And if we are not competitive, uh, you know, our exports are probably going to stagnate where they are, which is at 2% of overall global exports. And that number has not changed in the last decades or so. So in order to, you know, sort of think about what kind of trade trends that we can think of, I think there are clear synergies uh, between India and, you know, countries in the Indo-Pacific over issues like energy. Uh, we have clear uh, synergies over use of more technology and, you know, maybe even uh, extrapolating to that to say data privacy issues and stuff like that. There is room to, uh, you know, uh, coordinate and to basically facilitate uh, the use of open source technologies and things like that. And, you know, countries like India, Australia, uh, Japan, and, and US to a certain extent will find, you know, complement paths, which will also re uh, resonate really, really well, I think, with Southeast Asian economies, right? So, so we need to find these common grounds. And there needs to be a very focused, very uh, deterministic and very, uh, you know, consistent approach on it. We cannot be taking decisions on the fly. And we cannot be, you know, we, we, we have to be fairly long sighted on some of the strategic goals that are there. And economics has to be at the center of it. Well, we, we agree with you. Economics should be at the center of it. Elena, coming back to you, um, before we go into EU, again, let's talk about Japan. Japan has been very active in bringing this alliance together. And how do you think Japan would like to see this develop? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, I first would like to uh, mention uh, concerning the Indo-Pacific because, of course, Prime Minister Abe, in his speech to the Indian Parliament in the mid-2000s, he That's was right. uh, then right, the architect, so to speak, right. of the whole Indo-Pacific reference or shifting sort of the definition from Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific. At the time, um, you know, the democratic security diamond, so the cooperation between the four maritime democracies, uh, was promoted and also the quote very much originated from these Japan's policies as Japan was uh, facing China's rise and was becoming increasingly concerned and how to respond to China. Uh, but if we look at the very uh, debate, the whole debate on Indo-Pacific, of course, regions do not exist out there, right? The regions are defined, they are a matter of framing and they're very much a matter of how um, leaders and countries define their strategic perspectives. And I think in right. the Pacific, uh, we tend often to define it in a very exclusive way, sort of uh, specific countries facing China. But my view is that in the Pacific also had the inclusive option or rather presenting a duality between China in and China out perspective. And I think Japan's perspective on the Indo Pacific or in particular, the evolution of Japan's perspective from the mid 2000s until now is a clear example of this duality between China in and China out perspective. Now, during, in the early, on the mid 2000s, it was very much an exclusivist vision, the quote, the democratic security diamond, but at the time, Australia and India were very much not receptive to that view. That's and right. we all remember very well that the quote was sort of set aside for a long time until President Trump uh, revived, but until also Japan very much re-engaged with the concept and embarked on reconceptualization of the concept by very much adopting an exclusive yeah. or China in perspective. And here comes the difference in my view between the US perspective of the free and open Indo-Pacific and Japan's, even though there has been a convergence between, in, in some it's between President Trump and Prime Minister Abe on, for example, the emphasis on open, 
uh, democratic political systems, uh, freedom of navigation, rule of law, there has been quite a not so subtle difference and evolution between 2017 and now in Japan's official statements and documents of what Japan means. One thing is that free and open Indo-Pacific strategy has been replaced with concepts. So no longer it's a focus on strategy which would allude to a certain containment of China. It's now a concept which is actually open to interpretation, reinterpretation and accommodation of visions of ASEAN and other countries. Um, secondly, the focus on democracy and human rights has gradually been replaced with freedom of navigation, free, the free trade uh, narrative. And the more focus on, for example, um, economic prosperity through connectivity, maritime capacity building. So Japan has gradually uh, de-emphasized this, for example, democratization and focus on human rights in order to avoid potential criticism by non-democratic members in the Indo-Pacific in order to open the door for cooperation with countries, for example, of Vietnam, or to avoid criticism by countries that Japan may want to intervene in countries' domestic affairs, but possibly, in my view, Japan wants to open the door for cooperation with China. And if we look at Prime Minister Abe and President Xi Jinping's statements over the past three years, the fact that Japan is open to potential cooperation with China on the Belt and Road on a case-by-case -case basis, in my view, really attests to this um, more inclusive shift of, and redefinition of how Japan may be seeing the Indo-Pacific. Now, if we look at Indonesia, Indonesia, for example, has uh, promoted the narrative of open and inclusive, not using the word free. And if we look at India, India mm. has been very interesting because India has promoted the narrative of free, open and inclusive. In other words, using these three words and bringing, in my view, both the inclusive and exclusive vision into India's narrative. Sort of India being kind of, I have argued that India may be seen as a sort of a swing state tilting the balance towards inclusive or exclusive, because India obviously mm. uh, has been very careful in trying not to antagonize China, but at the same time, India has been also very much focusing on this uh, cooperation among the maritime democracies. And that's why I have called India a little bit of a swing state that will play a critical role in how this Indo-Pacific conceptualization may be shifted towards more China in or China, China out perspective. In any case, to That's conclude just my response here, the main difference I think between the Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific is that Asia-Pacific is very much related to the US-led hub and spoke security system, which do not extend to the Indo-Pacific because of course India has not been part of the hub and spoke security system or India has not been part of the official uh, and uh, traditional US-led alliances. And also Indo-Pacific really allows interpretation of the region as opposed to the Asia Pacific where we have the dominant US-led security system. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. That's uh, that is very interesting, the, uh, the differences that, that you have brought up and Japan's desire maybe to include China. And so I will come to, um, to Jim. Jim, I'm going to ask you two questions. One is, if the Indo-Pacific, talking about the building out of infrastructure, if the Indo-Pacific Alliance has to challenge the Belt and Road Initiative, what are the economic, infrastructural, and financing frameworks to follow? The Blue Dot Network is a start, and the, the U.S. has also created a new um, entity that will help to build uh, infrastructure with, with the Blue Dot uh, standard. Can this be the basis of an Indo-Pacific Charter? And to follow on that, can the Indo-Pacific Charter include China ever? Yes, uh, regarding the first question, it's the, the framework of the question is built upon the notion of um, what is the Belt and Road Initiative in terms of how is it implemented in these nations around the Belt and Road and whether or not it's truly beneficial to those nations. And so I think, I, you know, we talk a lot about debt trap uh, policy. Uh, 
and we're seeing the fruits of that. I've just made a swing through uh, the South Pacific this last year and it was in Loganville and the Solomons and Kiribati and, and I saw some of the impacts of uh, China's uh, debt trap uh, diplomacy through the Belt and Road. And I think it's incumbent on all of us that share the same values that we've been talking about that we need to point out that the Belt and Road Initiative uh, may not be the best alternative for nations, but that leaves the responsibility on us to provide something in lieu of that. And as a collective group, uh, we really haven't done that. So you mentioned the blue dot. The blue dots focus, uh, if you read their literature, it talks about quality and transparency and financial responsibility and not putting nations that would uh, be recipients of this uh, aid from these countries uh, it would be much different. And I think there's a lot more work that can be done in this arena, but it's going to take uh, the nations of the Quad and others in this Indo-Pacific region to really sit down together to discuss the details of that. But these, these, these small countries uh, that China is using, essentially co-opting in the United Nations to vote in favor of positions and policies that China wants, they're going to follow suit with the nation that provides them the resources that they need because their people are in, in, in destitute in some cases. And so we have to provide them something of an alternative. And I think the blue dot that focuses on you know, the integration of government, civil society, and private sector, all working together in a transparent way to provide quality infrastructure without strings attached and without uh, encumbrances that the Chinese put on those nations is very important. Now, I, I just don't think we have coalesced though around a bumper sticker that's called the Belt and Road counterpoint, and we need to get on with that. And I think, to answer your second question, a way to get there, to start moving down that track, is to come up with an Indo-Pacific Charter, like we had with an Atlantic Charter after World War II that lashed together the United States and Europe and helped Europe essentially rise up out of the ashes of, of combat. And we're not in the same kind of framework today in terms of the Quad nations and the Indo-Pacific region nations aren't coming out of a war zone, but they are facing a potential war zone, as I mentioned earlier in this timeline. And the imminency of what China is talking about doing should drive us to uh, come together. And I think the Indo-Pacific Charter is something that's well worth our, our capitals and our nations to sign on to, to, to sit down and talk about. And then you asked, could China ever be part of that? I don't think so, as long as the Chinese Communist Party is uh, running the People's Republic of China and stands on the values that they stand for. I don't see how you can have uh, that country inside a charter uh, that's uh, designed to promote freedom and democracy. And uh, one word I didn't hear in the discussions about economics was the word diversity. And uh, I, I think people were implying that, but I think it's important to point that word out. It's, we have all of us, the United States, Europe, uh, even India to a degree is mentioned in the, in the handsets. We're all been dependent upon the People's Republic of China to be kind of our supply chain uh, location for all kinds of things that we need. Well, that's not rational in any way, shape, or form. And so at least from a rational standpoint, people should be diversifying their portfolios as nations, as companies, and whatnot. And that's not protectionism. That's not isolationism. It's just good business practice. So I think the Indo-Pacific Charter is a time that's come. I think the virus has brought us to that. And I think what we're seeing China actually do on its, on its periphery and its actions and its arrogance and its bullying uh, should cause everybody to say, hey, we need to sit down and talk about how we can get together and uh, form a, a union, if you will, a charter that focuses on promoting the values that we stand for. Thank you. Um... I'm going to ask uh, another question, and I'm sure um, Pastor Raji Bhaja, we can, we can open it up to questions now. So either you raise your hand or uh, we suggest putting it on the chat. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a question to Elena. One of the things we've been discussing in our institute, really, as Captain um, Panel says, we really, Europe in particular, needs to, uh, needs to decouple from China and recouple to India. People forget that Europe was a very integrated part of India 200 years ago. Uh, the UK was, Europe was, and that seems to have gone nowhere. It's in the realm of history. 
you know, the Mughal Empire is today, but the European engagement with India seems like it was, you know, in the, like a thousand years ago. It hasn't been. And the influence of Europe is very present in India. So how can we get Europe to recouple? And maybe something, this, this is something that even Peter can answer. Elena? Yes, thank you. Um, I think the, uh, Europe's main strength, if we were even talking about Europe being a security actor broadly in Asia or in the Indo-Pacific, is apart from trade and economic relations, and this is one of the important aspects that here in Brussels has been the focus on EU-India relations because it's framed primarily in this economic and trade perspective, how to boost the, the, the partnership, the strategic partnership, is in non-traditional security. Uh, I think over the years, uh, Europe, Europe's or the EU's position on Asia, on security, on strategic partnership has evolved because in my view, if we look back, let's say 10 or 15 years, Europe had quite a lot of ambitions. Um, if yes. you look at, for example, EU-Japan partnership, and I give the Japan as an example, because out of the EU's strategic partnerships in Asia, so you have India, you have South Korea, you have Japan, it is with Japan, this is the most institutionalized and developed in security terms partnership. So India is really lacking behind so far in, in that regard, as well as South Korea, uh, even though in recent years there's, of course, growing uh, engagement with South Korea. And now what has happened that Europe has had for a long time quite a lot of aspirations. If you look at, for example, japan EU security relations back in 2001, they had an action plan, which was a massive document with all sorts of global problems included on that list and with a lot of aspirations. Ten years later, in 2011, they were reevaluating and they reached a conclusion that actually barely any of those objectives that they had can be realized. And so they embarked on another negotiation of economic partnership agreements, so free trade, which was signed in 2018, and strategic partnership, political binding agreement, which narrowed down to more specific objectives. And I think this is a very good approach that the EU has realized that you should narrow down those specific objectives and to look at what is your strength. And the strength is no military security. The EU has been, for example, a role in maritime security, piracy, um, uh, Capacity building, for example, that could be one and should be in EU's relations with countries yes. in the Indo-Pacific, but also more um, in, from EU's perspective, the EU's potential and interest would be in the Western Indian Ocean, right? Actually, areas, the maritime space that would be closer to Europe, Arabian Sea, um, East Africa, Gulf of Aden, this is what That's is right. for Europe the most important. And I think this is where... Europe should be focusing and engaging partners such as India, Japan, South Korea. There has already been some uh, anti-piracy operations exercises, but certainly not to the full extent that that can and has the potential to develop later on. So in my view, right. uh, apart from the economic trade relations, this should be focused on non-traditional security. And in my view, it is Europe expecting from Asian partners to contribute to European security rather than the EU being able to contribute to the interests of, of our partners right. in the broader Indo-Pacific. I think this is the strength. And as to the question of, uh, it was mentioned by earlier uh, speakers, maybe I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical. I'm not an expert on economic and trade issues and I would be happy obviously to hear from Raul, our trade expert on the panel. Uh, but from my, from my understanding, uh, can the EU decouple from China? Can the US decouple from China economic trade aspects? I don't think it's that easy to happen. I mean, it sounds very nice to discuss that, but how replaceable China is? Yes, Japan has been diversifying or trying to diversify away from China, but is China, can China really be replaced? China's significance? China is not going anywhere. China is there to stay. China's economic growth will continue even though not double digit, but still will continue. China will continue to play in the foreseeable future, in my view, the role of being the number one trading partner of most of US allies and partners in the Asia or Indo-Pacific region. So yes, countries try, can try to diversify, but to decouple, in my view, as a non-expert on economic and trade relations is uh, not 
physical possibility in the years to come. So, uh, Rahul, Manjeet, Alina, ask you a question. Yes. Yes. So, yes, I, I would, I would love to. No, I, hi, I'm Manjeet. This is Rahul here. So, I, I would love to yes, come. Please come, answer. I'd love to comment on this. So I, I think I completely agree with what uh, what Elena said because you know it does take a long time uh, for economic decoupling to happen. I'm not saying it's not possible, but you know given the interlinkages, uh, it is going to be a slow and steady burn rather than you know something that can be done overnight. You know one of the big differences between say the system that's there in say China and what's there in in most of the countries within the Indo-Pacific. Would be the uh, the dominance of private enterprises and the relative dominance of state enterprises. So, if you look at the way the U.S.-China trade war, you know, in the initial parts kind of played out, when when both countries were, you know, say uh, having a conflict, they were there was clear signs that China was able to very seamlessly pull back from from American supplies, and and you know we saw. Uh, U.S. exports to China fall quite dramatically. The same was not possible in case of the. Uh, on the contrary, because if anything, the trade deficit actually widened between U.S. and China instead of uh, coming off, and that's simply because that there were private enterprises at play. Right? I mean, it's very hard without giving enough uh, carrots, you know, and and maybe some sticks as well. It's it's difficult to convince private enterprises to completely walk away. Uh, for strategic reasons, it can be done over time. I think Japan has given a good uh, way of kind of doing it. I think if we sort of think back to what happened in you know in the mid 2000s when there were these protests over uh, Senkaku Islands or you know the Ajo Islands, whatever you want to call them, uh, there was uh, you know massive demonstrations against Japanese industries. I remember some the plants were burned down in China, and as a result, China came, uh, Japan came up with a strategy of China plus one. Uh, this has manifested itself into a very distributed supply chain. Something that Captain Pinel was talking about, you know, having diversification in in the way supply chains operate. And Japan has kind of given a model, but it takes time. It takes a lot of focus, and it it takes consistency of policies across the political spectrum. So, so it really needs a lot of vision and a lot of uh, you know support to be done at individual country and more so at at a, at somewhat of a global level. Um, we have a couple of very direct questions from our audience. One of them is, isn't it hypocrisy on the part of the US, Japan, etc., to ask like-minded democracies to counter communist China as a threat together in the Quad, uh, while parallelly making China's products, pockets, uh, deepen by manufacturing there? Who would like to take that question? Rahul? Do you want to go ahead with that? Uh, I, I think Captain Fennell had his hand up. Okay. But Let's, I, I, okay. So, so maybe I can add, add, add one line to it, you know, just since you have asked me. I would say, again, it comes back to the motivation of private enterprises. The reason why these private companies are there in China is because they, it has been made easy for them to operate and produce over there, right? If there were some issues on the ground, there would have been diversification of, of these supply chains. But I think uh, till the time, you know, China remains one of the best places to do business in uh, as far as the wider region is concerned, especially for manufacturing units. They have world-class infrastructure. And so a lot of those uh, things, I would say, are necessary conditions. You know, there, there, there might be certain sufficiency uh, points that would be required for them to move away. But then China does tick a lot of boxes on the necessary side. But, but I'll let Captain Fennell uh, add add to this point as well. Okay, Jim. Sure, uh, Raoul's uh, answer is very much better than mine probably will be. But the question was, is it hypocrisy? And the answer is most assuredly it is hypocrisy. And that's why there's many people in the United States right now that are pushing for ending these uh, hypocrisies as best we can. It's not a light switch. It won't be done overnight. It's something that will take time and tenacity. But just a couple of examples. Uh, recently, uh, in the United States, we have a fund that measures, it's called the Thrift Savings Plan, that all federal workers in our Department of Defense, retirees like myself, pay into every month. And there was a group, a board in Washington, D.C., that administers that fund, and they wanted to give uh, literally billions of dollars of U.S. military retiree money to the Chinese and open, the, open that money into the Chinese market. And a number of us got together and wrote a couple of letters to the president. And he came up and struck that down and has told the board, you're not going to do that. 
there's another thing yesterday or in this week, the uh, Department of Defense in the United States identified 20 companies that are associated with the People's Liberation Army that have been operating or soon to be in the market in the United States stock market. And we're recommending again that this be cut off. So there are things when you get really start drilling down into the details that can make it very hard uh, for private capital to continue to support uh, the communist regime in China. And I think there's a growing awareness in America now uh, that this is something that needs to be done. And my only encouragement to other nations is, is that you have to look hard and you have to see uh, what you're giving China, where does that money go? And you just saw this, the National People's Congress in May, the Chinese said for the first time in over 30 years, they have no GDP gross domestic product forecast for this year, for 2020. But they did say, we are still going to have a 6.6% growth in our military spending. And that tells you, and we've known this, tells you where China's priorities are, and it's putting money into their military. So if we keep giving them money to build tanks and jets and nuclear That's submarines right. and nuclear silos, it's all gonna come back to us someday. Uh, um, Vice Admiral Sudarshan? Would you like to Would you like to add to that? And I'm going to ask you another question as well. But please, would you like to add uh, to this? Well, uh, I I think what what Captain Pennell said, uh, you know, is something we need to think about. Uh, uh, China just is is a huge huge concern in every way. It's an economic concern, and at the end of end of uh, you know thirty years of China's prosperity, its peaceful rise. Where are we today? Uh, with respect to China, if 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 truly you know the rise was peaceful, if it was a win-win situation, uh, then we ought to ought ought not, ought not to be discussing the things we are discussing this evening or afternoon. Um, and and those yeah. are those are real real concerns. I mean that's that's all I would like to say. Uh, at, at the end of it all, with all the readjustment going on, maybe it will take a few years. Uh, China will still be economically interacting with a lot of nations. I mean I I agree. Uh, with Elena, that China is not going to go away, and it didn't go away. I mean, a whole lot of things can continue to be done. But instead of China modifying everybody's behavior, I think it's time yes. that uh, everybody got together and uh, not urged because urgings don't work, but uh, you know, to, to a great extent now pressures uh, China to modify its behavior. I think uh, uh, that's what needs. Yeah. You had Thank you. I think that answers said. the question. Yes, I just said people wanted to know, there were questions in the audience. People want to know, why is the world not united against boycotting China? Only, you know, India, obviously, but the US and Australia have spoken up. But why are there not greater calls for this? Is it just fear? Uh, I, I, I would say, you know, again, what, what Captain Fennell was saying, it, uh, hypocrisy is, is a... Is a, is, a, is, a, is a constant uh, you know, uh, neighbor and a constant uh, uh, accompanist uh, to most of what nations do, companies do. So uh, it's, I, I firstly think it is not absolutely necessary to uh, uh, totally boycott China. That's, that's not going to be uh, very, very beneficial overall. But uh, we, we do need to come together, as I said, uh, and uh, uh, get, get China to be part of of a world order that uh, uh, that as we say in, in in navies and I'm sure Captain Farrell knows this term well good order and naval discipline uh, in the world so uh, that there will continue to be these you know contradictions all 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 international relations have to handle contradictions they are not going to go away we'll have to live with some contradictions but within those I think uh, there has to be a, a focus on the Indo-Pacific Charter on the Quad. And uh, on on you know uh, uh, rowing together with in, in, in ships of state, if I could put it that way. Thank you. I know everybody has a lot to say, Elena. I'm going to I'm going to be back in conversation with all of you at some point, but we are running out of time. Um, so I'm going to ask um, uh, Rajiv Bhatia, my my colleague who is a distinguished fellow at Gateway House, to maybe close and tie up the threads of all the various um, very deep thoughts that we've heard this evening. Rajiv? Thank you Rajiv, very much, Manjit. 
Thank you very much. I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I would take just uh, three minutes or so to uh, present uh, my perspective. Uh, uh, I think uh, one would like very much to begin by saying very clearly that this has been a very rich and uh, thought-provoking dialogue that we at Gateway House have been privileged to have organized uh, with the assistance of CAST. What really comes out very clearly is that a totally holistic and comprehensive approach is required to first of all comprehend the challenges and the developments uh, that are there in Indo-Pacific and then slowly start finding uh, a kind of a solution to them which may be acceptable to most of the stakeholders. So this holistic thing uh, does apply not only uh, to uh, the Pacific Ocean but also to the Indian Ocean. We have not gone into the details of uh, both the water bodies but clearly comments were very much implying that uh, those two pillars of the Indo-Pacific Palace have to be addressed. Uh, it came out also very clearly that uh, there are different concepts, there are different definitions, there are even different geographical contours of Indo-Pacific, but there is a growing consensus as to what the issues are. And it is in that context uh, my second point, which uh, I understood from the dialogue, is that the concept of inclusivity is now coming under strain. I think this is the new development that we are seeing in the early part of the COVID era, that uh, it is not just about including or excluding China, but it is, as Admiral said very rightly, to see whether there can be broader cooperation in terms of trying to modify or help and encourage China to modify its behavior because if that does not come through, then there is a problem. Uh, thirdly, I think it came out very, very clearly and I think we should be very grateful to Rahul for bringing this forward that there has to be a better alignment between the economic objectives and the strategic objectives. This is the logic of the holistic approach. Uh, there are expectations, benefits, dividends coming out from the region's relationship with China. And yet it is the same country, which is the source of threats and challenges as well. So uh, all of us have to prepare for better alignment. Uh, there was a reference very much to ASEAN. Uh, there was probably need for a greater focus on ASEAN because some of us believe at Gateway House that uh, Indo-Pacific uh, without ASEAN is a table without legs. Uh, now, as we all know, ASEAN took uh, years before they came out with their outlook uh, on Indo-Pacific and we really have to involve and engage them more closely uh, in this dialogue. Finally, I think we also need to remember that while we have put focus on China, there are other powers. I think it's very, we are very grateful to Elena to try to bring out the final points with regard to Japan. But as Lavi Institute said, there are two superpowers in this region, US and uh, China. And there are two major powers in this region, which are India and Japan. And the relationships among these four countries, plus their relationships in turn, with the remaining 12 member states of the East Asian Summit. That is what is going to determine the future of uh, Indo-Pacific. We are very grateful to all the scholars to have shared uh, their perspectives. We want to assure them that we will carry this forward and go into even more granular detail when we take up uh, the question of uh, the Quad very soon in a similar format. So Manji, thank you very much. Uh, we have learned a lot today. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, 